Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the conference. Welcome to um, the workshop on social investment for social enterprise, um, which is sponsored um, by Big Lottery Fund. Uh, my name is Mark White. I work for Charity Bank. Um, we're joined by Jeff Jones from Wales Council for Voluntary Action, looks after the Communities Investment Fund, and we're very pleased to have with us Hugh Rolo, who's Innovation Director from Locality. Um, I'm facilitating this workshop, and the idea what we want to achieve out of this workshop is to answer any specific questions people may have and specific concerns around investment, social, social investment within their social enterprise. But also we want to stimulate some debate and some discussion around what's happening in Wales now, what we want to happen in terms of developing social investment and social finance into social enterprises, and get some messages back to, um, to government, to funders, and just see what, uh, what we can do in terms of moving things forward. Um, in terms of setting the scene, uh, just some themes there that I'd like to just touch on before my colleagues um, uh, hand over to my colleagues for, for briefly. The idea is not to be death by PowerPoint. We want to stimulate debate amongst you. So I'm going to do a very quick whistle-stop tour in terms of setting that scene. Um, so starting really with the changing in funding environment in Wales, I'm sure we're all very conscious of what's gone on in the last few years and where we are. Um, the big theme there really is that there have been significant reductions in public sector grants over the last few years. Now there are some exceptions to, the, to the, those rules, but they are the exceptions and the trend is that public sector funding is reducing, certainly through, through the grant schemes. Um, a big driver in Wales has been for some years now, and will be for the foreseeable future, um, European funding. Um, but again, those programmes are changing. Um, one of the things that Jeff and I were involved in in WCVA was the Communities Investment Fund, which was a bit of an experiment for, um, for Welsh Government, but using loan finance as a real option for social enterprises. That's not to say there haven't been loan providers in Wales um, for some time, um, but Communities Investment Fund certainly tried to change the culture and develop loan finance as much more of an option. And that brings us back to European funding, I'm afraid, because European funds in the next round of, of funding will be focusing on um, loans and other financial instruments rather than straightforward grants. So again, that's all part of the change in environment. Um, I think it's important to touch on the fact that whilst there have been third sector lenders down here for some years, um, there are signs that they are moving into the marketplace down here. So my own employers, Charity Bank opened up a regional office a couple of years ago. Um, Unity Trust Bank have invested in staff down here as well. Um, all of this is set against the background of the way that social enterprise is developing in Wales. Again, it's not to say that social enterprise hasn't always been here in some way, shape or form. Of course it has. Um, but uh, it, it's very much been um, uh, the case that over the last few years, Welsh Government is certainly investing in development of social enterprise. But where does that sit at the moment? It's a very one-dimensional view at the moment, I feel, as regards what constitutes a social enterprise, and that's very much been driven by the funders' agendas. Um, our friends in Welsh European Funding Office, our friends in Welsh Government, very much view social enterprise as being a company limited by guarantee, possibly a registered charity as well. And so again, setting the scene, is that right? Well, it's the status quo, but how do we change that and look at other ways of doing things? And this comes into this whole idea of looking at social enterprise as, is it a legal structure or is it a state of mind? I think most of us in the room know which one out of those two we'd rather look at, state of mind rather than legal structure. <coughs> so that brings us to, to the whole issue of where we are now, that have those views on, fi on traditional legal structures um, constrained financial innovation uh, for, so for social enterprise uh, within Wales over the last few years and how can we change that going forward. Um, as I've said, Welsh Government have invested and are investing significant amounts of money um, through various, the various support agencies I've listed there to develop social enterprise um, with a particular push towards delivery of public sector services through the third sector. And I think it's important that um, this year, 
uh, Welsh Government shifted their policy towards social enterprise in as much as it's moved over from social justice and local government departments into mainstream business and now sits within um, the Minister's portfolio. Um, that then presents another dimension that apart from delivery of public services, social enterprise is clearly being viewed by Welsh Government as a driver of the economy now. So again, that sets the scene. But that still leaves us with this situation that, frankly, direct investment into social enterprise still seems quite limited um, in terms of the options in Wales, grants, loans. Um, with limited options on the loan side for what we call patient capital, um, which very, very broadly means capital that doesn't necessarily require a financial return immediately. So what else is happening elsewhere? I'm not going to labour on this. Um, Hugh um, has come down from locality to give us some views on what else is happening elsewhere. So I'm just going to do a very quick bullet points through there. But there are other ways of doing things. And some of those things are happening down here. But it's a question today of how we can sort of generate that momentum and get things moving and try and get those different ways of doing things further up the, uh, the Welsh Government agenda and certainly up our own, up, uh, further up our own agenda. So things like community share issues seem to be building ahead of steam uh, within communities, certainly the ones that I'm going out to. Um, other ideas, such as joint ventures with the private sector, um, equity investment, other forms of patient capital, social impact bonds as well. Um, it seems to me that every week there's something in the, in, the, in the news about social impact bonds and other types of bond issue. Um, scope as a major national charity have just made a, a £20 million bond issue, basically um, underwritten against the income from their charity shops. So how can we take those ideas and apply them to financing social enterprise and funding social enterprise in Wales? Uh, again, there's a plethora of different um, <coughs> types of finance and funding providers, um, certainly over the other side of Offers Dyke. What can we learn from them? How can we bring those ideas uh, over here and, uh, and make them happen? Um, Jeff, Jeff Jones worked, works on the Communities Investment Fund, and we thought it would be a good idea to just look at a typical Welsh example of a social enterprise that's tried to make this transition from grant dependency um, and uh, try and reduce its uh, grant junkiness, if you like, towards a more self-sustaining financial model. Um, so we felt that would be quite a quite apposite in terms of setting the scene. And what options might they have going forward for further development and for, through further use of more innovative ways of social financing? Okay. Gentlemen, if I could hand over to Hugh. Um, Hugh Rollo of uh, Locality. There we go. Okay. Great. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to whip through these uh, because um, there's too many of them and death by PowerPoint is awful. Um, uh, I had to produce a load of slides because this is a secure building or something. We had to have everything cleared through it anyway. So there's many too many. Um, but Campsite and Agale is what I'm talking about. So we are in an extraordinary time where we see possibly um, serious collapse within uh, mainstream financial capitalism. We see serious dysfunctionality um, by the financial system, the conventional financial system. And within it, there is this tiny little corner of um, at some attempt at sanity uh, in terms of social finance. And I want to talk a little bit about what's going on. But very important to this is the background of the complete dysfunctionality and collapse of the conventional financial systems, particularly around debt and the whole idea that um, uh, we have just tried to use, A, there is much, much too much debt, and B, we've tried to use debt to do things that debt was never meant to do. So that's the context in which I'm talking. Um, 
I work for Locality. It's the merger of the DTA and BASAC in England. Uh, the DTA Wales still continues to trade under that name. It's a network of community enterprises. Assets and enterprise don't rely on the state. You'll always be short of money. Do it for yourselves. 600 members, loads of assets, loads of income. I've never had an original idea in my life, but I wander around the members nicking their best ideas. Um, my experience in social finance, I have a dark past. I was in the city of London in the 80s. Um, uh, I've been saying that for years and people didn't really know what I mean. You do now. Um, uh, um, I helped set up Key Fund in Yorkshire, distributing European money. We gave a bunch away and then we started bribing people to borrow a bit from us. We've now lent 10 million pounds. We've lost 8% of that over the last 10 years, investing very similarly to Jeff, I think, in startup and early growth stage of social enterprise. The Adventure Capital Fund, now social invention, uh, investment business, is the big uh, UK, uh, English government um, uh, backed organization that's distri distributed a lot of government funding. I'll come back to that. And I've led on the community shares program running in England for the last two years. Um, some stats about the size of the market. It is a growing market. It's still quite small in absolute terms. But there are some big players, not least Charity Bank, Triodos, Unity. Um, there are some big players out there. It is quite a developed market. Um, you need different kinds of funding at different stages of the process. Um, there is never enough risk money um, around. Um, bankers make their money by confusing you and bamboozling you. There are only three kinds of money. Uh, development finance, uh, what you need in order to work out how you're going to do what you want to do. Capital for the kit that you need to do it and working capital um, for your monthly in and outs. Um, never lose sight of that. If people tell you that there's other kinds of money, um, work out why they're trying to do that. It'll be part of the beginning of trying to confuse you, um, and that's how they'll make their money out of you. Um, stages of growth, you need different kinds of money at different stages of growth. Anybody who produces a linear um, uh, uh, a business plan that says um, my growth is going to go that way. You know that they're not real, that they don't understand. Uh, Jim and Jeb Oshie were quite good on that, I thought, this morning. You know, be real about it. This stuff is hard. If you bubble around the break-even line for the first couple of years, you'll probably be doing quite well. Um, you need risk capital at early stages of growth. Debt finance does not provide that, or at least conventional debt finance does not provide that for you. Just a word about the social investment business. A little venture capital fund started with, um, it was David Blunkett came to us one Christmas and said, the Home Office have clawed back two million quid from serious crime. Um, will you get that invested as patient capital by March, please, in social enterprise? Um, and we said, yeah, thanks, David, we will. Um, four of us uh, scared around the country um, tr trying to work out how the hell to do this. We made loads of mistakes on the way. Um, but Adventure Capital Fund has grown and been handed loads of DOSH now, over 400 million pounds of government money. It's made loads of mistakes, has learned an awful lot about patient capital investment. Um, the big uh, schemes are up there, particularly, I think, Social Enterprise Investment Fund, the stuff around the health agenda, spin-outs of people working in the health service, delivering services back. Um, in the parts of the country, like Wales, like Yorkshire, where I'm based, where the public sector accounts for 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of GDP, we need to be real about where the markets are. And when we're talking about social enterprise, working with the grain of the public sector, selling back into the public sector, is going to be your biggest market. There ain't much private sector out there. Um, so be real about that. 
similarly, Future Builders, uh, obviously a big experiment in terms of um, encouraging social enterprise to deliver uh, public service. So just a bit about the shares program. Um, I think there is a huge movement um, away from uh, uh, debt finance. Um, we need that risk finance. That's the difficult stuff. I've been very excited by community shares program. We work with these 10 in order to get them to offer stage. Um, I think the important thing that we need to capture, though, is this changing public attitude. Um, most people um, are savers, not investors. But their savings, if they put them in the conventional financial system, are at, uh, at the mercy of the casino. And I think there is a real movement for people to take back control of their own savings and say, actually, I don't want to stick it um, in a casino bank that's going to use it to short the Italian bonds and uh, exacerbate the euro crisis. I would much prefer to invest it um, uh, in my local pub, in my local shop, in my local town center. So if you like, the taking back of responsibility for our investments. Also for our pension funds, uh, those of us lucky enough um, to be in work and contributing to a pension fund, just hand over to the pension funds. And, and the real crime is that the pension funds have then given the money to the casino gamblers. And so the bit of stuff that is supposed to be for long-term wealth has gone into the casino. That distortion of value can't continue. So community shares really taken off, at least in terms of registrations. Um, uh, this is a slide, I think, updated in September. Um, we believe that there'll be 100 registrations this year. Um, we're trying to work on match funding schemes, so to say, um, uh, to try and create a pot of money so that um, where local people raise £100,000, um, institutional investors like, for instance, Key Fund would say, OK, we will match fund those. We're also looking at underwriting share schemes so that if you get an option to buy for six months the local shop and you need to raise £100,000 in order to do that, that you would be able to uh, have that £100,000 underwritten, that is guaranteed, um, that in some form you'd have access to that. Um, just across the trades, obviously, there's been huge interest in renewable energy um, for community shares, partly driven by the formerly very favorable Fitz regime. It's been changed in relation to PV, as I'm sure you're aware, um, but um, still pretty advantageous for um, the, um, the anaerobic digesters and the wind farms. These business models really work. Um, engaged investors lead to engaged business models. I guess the big stat here is of the 400 plus community shops now, um, only two of them have gone bust. And if you think about closure of rural shops, um, the engagement, the crowd, if you like, and taking the crowd with you, is actually reinforces the business model. So I'm really cantering through this stuff. Okay. So there's now quite a crowded set, and I've just put this up, not, I, I know it's not a very uh, clear side, but there's quite a lot of players, and there's a load more coming into the marketplace. The big thing on the horizon um, is big society capital. Um, the unclaimed assets money in the commercial banking system will finally come out sometime early next year. There's 130 million next year, um, and 140 million the year after that. So there is a wall of money coming this way. Um, it's, it's wholesale money, so it's going to be invested through community finance institutions and what they're calling SIFIs, Social Investment Financial Intermediaries. Um, so it's not going to come straight to uh, social enterprise and community enterprise. But there is a wall of money coming this way, and it is going to change the market in quite profound ways. Social investment bonds uh, mentioned. Um, they're not bonds at all. 
part of the bamboozlement process is also that people will call things by names that they think sound sexy and clever. Um, uh, but these aren't bonds at all in the sense that I understand a bond, which is a bearer debt instrument that is tradable. This is a long term. It's an eight-year contract um, uh, against or the only one in the marketplace at the moment. It was funded by soft funds, so the lottery and trust funds are the original funders of this. And it's a performance-related contract that pays a bonus against uh, achievement of milestones. It is much better. I, I, I mean, I, I'm a fan. I'm delighted to see social enterprises getting proper contracts. It's an eight-year contract. Who wouldn't give their eye teeth for, for an eight-year contract to deliver a public service with the government paying the money at the end of the day um, and investors putting up the money up front for the cash flow? It's a great contract. The difficulty is the metrics to measure it and the bonus payment are so complicated that they haven't yet done another one. So there's an awful lot of, just like with PFI, there's an awful lot of um, metrics design around that's needed in terms of social impact bond. Um, just some stuff uh, that I think you should be looking at in terms of, this is the policy paper, Nesta had a load of papers. Um, I'm assuming all these slides will be available, you can go and look at this stuff, but this is the kind of stuff that I'm looking at. Also, social investment business have just produced something around impact investing and how you can use debt um, or the underlying instrument of debt to provide what they're calling intermediate capital, patient capital uh, in this way. So just very quickly, looking forward. Clearly, uh, there's no money, there's no money. We spent all the money. We've borrowed all the money we dare spend. So um, how can we do more for less? This whole idea of preventative investment, <laughs> of not just early intervention, but earlier intervention, in order to generate cashable savings for the public sector. Um, this has got to be an area of uh, at least creative debate for social enterprise um, to do it. And I believe that social enterprise has some important competitive advantages in terms of um, operating in this preventative investment uh, territory. It is usually based on the kind of deep value relationship that the state can't form and the private sector is always going to skimp on forming that deep value relationship. Um, the uh, immediate area of focus in England is around families with complex needs. Um, a settlement in Newham in East London has worked out that there are 10 families in Newham costing the local authority six million quid and they're developing a proposal to go to Newham and say, we can't do anything with those 10 families. They're already doing the drugs, in jail, involved with social services. But what about giving us a contract so we work with preventing the next 10 families emerging at that cost to the state? Collaborative consumption. Um, putting consumption together, quite simply, and forming a business model out of that. Um, I know DTA Wales, for instance, are actively running a scheme where they're doing a bulk purchase of, uh, of utility for, for DTA members. Ideas around p agglomerating demand uh, and making that stack up, I think, uh, are really important. I just want to mention crowdfunding, um, web-based appeals for finance. There are a number of sites um, I'm working with Michael Norton on BuzzBank, um, but there's Crowdcube, there's half a dozen. Um, so going directly to people and asking a large number of people to invest small amounts of money in your business proposition. Been used very successfully in the arts field um, for a number of years, but increasingly a source of risk capital for social enterprise. What Michael Norton will tell you is that all the web does is provide the mechanism for collecting the money. You still have to do the legwork and the marketing in order to drive people to your site to get the money. 
much talked about, not yet delivered huge amounts of money. Bonds, there are a number of bonds or things that people are calling bonds. The Alia bonds that are basically uh, structured around tax. Uh, there are a number of high tax payers who are interested in investing in charitable bonds. They're prepared to give up any interest payments for a five-year period in return for the tax benefit. And the interest that they give up is then discounted forward and given as a grant to charities. So large sums of money raising not so large sums of money for charities, but Ali have done, I think, 20 bonds by now. Um, the Scope Bond, pioneered by Charity Bank, essentially is using a very good charity brand, Scope, working with mental health people, to raise money cheaper. It was 3% fixed for five years. That's cheaper money um, than normally would be the case by not going through the banking system. Um, and Bristol together have also just issued a 1.2 million pound bond um, uh, at the same time. The big thing that we need to do is align our long-term savings, both individual and institutional, with the values that we want to do. And um, I was amazed to see George Osborne saying, oh, wouldn't it be a good idea if our pension funds invested in our roads rather than sticking it in the hedge fund? Pigs might fly, I suppose. Um, what I see is both um, a supply glut in the social investment market and a demand push. They're misaligned. The supply gut will be around conventional debt finance. Uh, the demand is for risk finance in order to get that away. Um, uh, there's just some stats about Big Society Bank, uh, Big Society Capital. I should declare an interest. I'm an advisor to Big Society Capital. Um, and those are my contact details. Sorry if I went on too long. So. Uh, so thanks, Hugh. There's some really interesting, uh, in innovative ideas that you've brought up there. I'm, I'm going to bring it back to a Welsh context, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit around uh, the challenges and the lessons that we learnt in terms of the first phase of the Communities Investment Fund uh, and how we're going to try and move forward with those lessons uh, and some of the case studies around that, really. But if I could take an opportunity to give us a bit of a plug, uh, the Communities Investment Fund, um, you may or may not be aware, but we're, we're actually about to launch the second phase of the fund. Um, it's uh, a £6 million fund, uh, and the launch, the official launch is going to be uh, November the 30th at the factory, which, if you're not aware, it's uh, a social enterprise uh, that's been set up by Valley's Kids, a very well-established uh, social enterprise charity working uh, in the, the uh, RCT Valleys. Um, and basically, they've uh, purchased, with our assistance, uh, it was part of a funding jigsaw, really, but we, we were able to provide the loan finance element of that to help them to purchase what was the pop factory in Porth, and it's going to be a really innovative venue, a creative hub within the community, any profits from that, obviously, will be then uh, regenerated back into the work that's been done uh, by Valley's Kids. So that's the 30th of November. So in terms of the second phase, we've got £6 million to invest over the next three years. Uh, two, two of the big issues, obviously, whenever there's any surveys about social enterprises, the two things that are always flagged up are, one, access to finance, and, and two, how do we get involved in procurement and public service delivery? So what we're trying to do with the Communities Investment Fund, really, £4 million of these six is specifically aimed at social enterprises who are looking to get involved in the procurement process, looking to get involved in public service delivery. Uh, and we're able to assist in terms of very flexible terms. We're able to assist in asset development, working capital, uh, all the things that Hugh t talked about, really, in terms of the, the three kinds of finance that's required, really. Uh, the other two million is general um, social enterprise uh, development, really. Uh, and Mark touched on the notion of patient capital. And as a fund, that's really what we're about. We are a loan fund, 
So we do expect repayment, but the repayment is flexible, uh, and it's on terms that work with the, uh, the actual, with the organization borrowing, really. Okay, so that's, that's the plug, and obviously I'm going to be around today if anyone wants further information about that. Also, there's going to be the launch of another project that's close to my heart and I'm going to be involved in, which is uh, Enterprising Communities, which is a project that links with uh, the CVCs for uh, social enterprise development, and I can tell you more about that if you want afterwards. Okay, so in terms of um, the challenges and the lessons learned in the first phase of the Communities Investment Fund, and in terms of social enterprise funding uh, and third sector funding, loan funding in, in Wales, uh, the first phase was 3.4 million uh, of, uh, 2.8 2 of that was of loan, was of debt finance, and the, the remainder was grants. Grants are essential, I think, they're a stepping stone. The Communities Investment Fund, I think it's uh, safe to say, is probably the first step on the ladder towards um, more commercial, conventional debt finance. Uh, so in terms of organizations moving away, moving through that spectrum from grant to loan, Communities Investment Fund was the first, perhaps, step on that ladder, really. So. In, in terms of the lessons and the challenges that we faced, I think the first ones that we should look at would be the ones in terms of WCVA, Wales Council of Voluntary Action, as an organisation. Because obviously we were very set up and structured to run uh, grant funding programmes, but it was a, a very much a different uh, way of doing things and, and the, the, the rationale and the structures that you need in place uh, were different and I think what initially we were finding were, were there, there was also a mentality where org organizations would come to us and it would almost be well it, it's it's a grant really isn't it you know do, does it need to be repaid and we would say oh yeah yes it does need to be repaid and it was almost a, a, a different mindset really that organizations had to get involved in and obviously as a as an organization we had to have a different mindset because we were used to administering grants uh, where Basically, we would look at a specific project and then we would say, oh, okay, we want you to deliver to these outcomes and these outputs. Uh, and, but whereas what we were now looking at was the whole organization. You have to look at the whole business plan and do a due diligence process around that. So how the finances stack up. Is there a business model there? Is there the right governance in place, the right uh, structures, you know, the right people, really? So I think the decision was made, obviously Mark mentioned that prior to jumping ship and going to Charity Bank, he was actually involved and he managed the Communities Investment Fund. So Mark's background was obviously through, uh, prior to that, was in banking. My background, I'd worked for a number of years with the Wales Cooperative Centre, but prior to that I was involved in uh, working on a pension fund and, uh, for an actuarial uh, kind of uh, company. So our background was, was kind of slightly different, I suppose. Coming, so we were coming at it with different skills. And again, it was about us developing an understanding of, of the differences, you know, and, and, and why the organizations were, were, were different. So in, in terms of the organizations that were coming to us and, and the issues and the applicants that we were receiving, in terms of there were some common themes that were coming through. Uh, and, and one of them really was some of the issues in relation to uh, internal organizational structures of the organization. Again, and, and rightly so, a lot of the organizations that have grown out of community groups or out of the voluntary sector uh, would come to us and they'd be very clear on the social community benefits and rightly so because of equal importance in terms of the finance and the interventions that we make is the social return and the community benefit as well as the financial return. But it, they were often clear about that. But if we would say to them, could you articulate that in a business plan, in, in a financial forecast, have you got cash flows about this? That, that there was often an inability to provide that information to us. Uh, and obviously that then you know, is, is gonna create a, a, a huge issue for us because that's sort of the mindset that we've really got and it has to stack up financially, it has to work. And, and the, the, the assessment panel who make the decisions, their, th their, their thinking is, it was largely around, does, does it work? Is the organization able to service the debt? Is there the growth in there? These kind of issues, really. 
one of the other issues that, that we found was very common was something to do with the governance structures, really. And that would often be that you would have a call from whether it would be the, uh, the chief officer this, of the organization, a development officer who was very close to what was happening uh, at the grassroots within that sector, realized some of the issues we were talking about, that there was you know, the changing funding uh, schemes that were going on and realizing that the, the grant dependence was, was, was changing and, and was prepared to engage and take the risk uh, to, to look at loan finance. So we would have really proactive and interesting conversations with them. Uh, and then what would happen would we then would meet with the board of trustees and obviously their issues in terms of their, their actual duties are different and what they need to look at in terms of risk are different as well. Uh, and what would then happen would be that there would often be a, a, a different mindset you know, sometimes it would be, well, no, we don't want to go along that route, even if we would explain that we weren't interested, obviously, in personal guarantees or in we were prepared to lend uh, on an unsecured basis. And there, there was sometimes that mindset, well, this is what we've always, you know, we've always been able to get grants and we, we, don't, we don't want to do anything to do with, with, with loans, you know. Uh, but interestingly, uh, and again, you know, that, that's a lot to do with what's happening externally. But it is interesting that in the time that I've been involved, you know, the, the, if the, the actual attitude in, in speaking at events like this or, or in going and, and interacting with, with specific uh, third sector organisations and social enterprises, it, there's been a real, real sea change in attitude and that, that's really clear. Um, one of, I think, the other issues that we've really, uh, that I've noticed and perhaps the challenge is, is how organisations actually approach funders, we, I would often find that people would ring up and it's how you convey the message, isn't it? Because it would be, almost people would be saying, um, coming across with such a negative viewpoint, it would almost be like, we're about to run out of money in, in three weeks' time, you know, we're desperate, will you lend us money? And it's almost like, well, I think you need to sort of take a deep breath and, and look about how you're putting your message across because you're not really selling yourself in a positive light. So. I think it's, a, it's about the way the message, the vision of the organization is articulated. Uh, and again, that is, that is uh, a comment that I would have, that organizations sometimes aren't, aren't clear enough in the way they articulate their, their vision and their message, really. Um, in terms of, again, an, another issue that we, we've had, and I think is, is a, a valuable lesson in, in terms of um, there's been a common theme, really, in that as someone who would try as much as possible and would really get to, to work closely with, with that potential applicants, I think it's difficult then for you getting involved. And obviously, we've got a, a process where there's a, there's a clear separation and the, uh, the decisions to lend are made by an independent assessment panel. But what would sometimes happen then, uh, because of the way things were structured, you know, I would always get very uh, involved, you know, and uh, people would then sort of think, oh, he's a good egg, Jeff, he's on our side, yeah, we quite like him, uh, and he's come up with some good ideas about how we can take this forward, and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm coming there with a loan, loan agreement, and then saying, oh, well, the repayments are starting the next month, uh, and then, you know, so it's, it's almost good cop, bad cop, and I think you almost need a, a structure where you have someone who's taking care of the kind of the, the risk, really, uh, and from and is making sure that, that the monitoring I is taking place correctly, really. And in terms of that, we talked about patient capital and how that can work in flexibility. As, as a social enterprise, as third sector organizations who might be going into this, I would, I would suggest to you one of the key things, one of the real issues that we've had is organizations who've not informed us that they're getting into trouble until it's too late, it's often, or, or it makes it difficult for us. Uh, you know, it really, a relationship uh, between the lender and, and the organization that's being lent to is all about trust, really. Uh, and the, the trust can easily break down where you're speaking to people, maybe, you know, just making a monthly phone call, really, because you think everything's going well. 
And the one thing I don't want to be doing is, you know, re is sitting next to people once a week, sort of, you know, asking them to provide management information for me when that's not necessary. Um, so, you know, you give people their headspace and let them get on. And if they're telling you things are going well, when you find out that perhaps they aren't, you know, that, that it's difficult. The trust is eroded slightly. And also, it makes it more difficult to intervene because the issue is if some people come to us and say, we're having issues, then we can say, well, let's look at a repayment holiday. Where are these issues coming from? What kind of support can we provide for you to, to actually uh, assist and take that forward? In, in, terms of, uh, in terms of case studies or to, to, to look at lessons learned, I, I think one of the key things that I would say is that small interventions financially have made really, really big returns. When I look at some of the, we supported in the first phase over 40 organisations and interestingly it was some of the smaller loans that we made that have made the biggest impact in, in the way that some of the ones that were the, that were the bigger organisations that were able, because they had the capacity, the track record to apply for 250,000, for example, for uh, an asset development project, you know, they, they, they were going to be in a position to do that anyway, and they probably could have done it through commercial finance routes. But I can think of examples where interventions of, of 30,000, which were basically providing the revenue funding uh, to organisations which they wouldn't have been able to get elsewhere. They perhaps had uh, some grant funding to provide the capital, but they weren't going to be able to get the revenue. Uh, and th there's one organisation that, that I can think of that we lent to. Uh, and when we lent, lent it to them, which would have been about three, four, three and a half years ago, uh, it, was, it was deemed to be very, very high risk because, you know, that they, they had a track record of sort of bumping along the bottom uh, and it was a big, big change, a big cultural leap for them really to go and take on uh, sort of to develop tradable income. But the, the actual, the, the funding that we were able to give them was, was the last piece in the funding jigsaw and since then they've really, really soared. I mean they've had a big asset transfer project, they're, they're, they're now up and running a, a, a really amazing kind of um, uh, hub which is, you know, which is taking in lots of other projects and social enterprises. Uh, they're actually running a number of national projects. And, and, and interestingly, I think, you know, the, 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 the change was really, really around the fact in the change in their mindset, the fact that they were prepared to say, actually, we think we're able to take a risk with this loan finance. We see it as a tool. We see it as a mechanism to provide a, a, a way forward, really. And uh, they've, they've, they've really gone on from that. So... As I think, there's one message that I think I want to get across, and I'm being told to wind, wind up, so I will do so, is the reality is, as, as Mark pointed out, if we look at European funding, it's all about, you know, financial instruments are going to be really important to the next phase. So as, as social enterprises, third sector organisations, I think you really need to look at your internal structures to make sure that they're, uh, you know, that, and, and look at these possibilities and, and look beyond the existing uh, funding mechanisms. So that, that's my bit. I'm around all day if anyone wants to specifically talk about the fund that, we, that I'm uh, involved in. But if we could throw it open to the floor, because it's about you, it's not about us, however much I like it to be. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Hugh. Um... <laughs> well, yes, we, we have about half an hour. Um, for questions and interaction, and that is what this workshop is about. Um, there's quite a lot to talk about there. Um, we can just talk specifically about loan finance if you've got any specific concerns, but I think what we'd like to do is get some thoughts going across the floor on these different um, finance and funding options that could potentially be available. Um, there is no question at the moment things are quite limited in Wales, but as Hugh's illustrated, there's an awful lot of other things going on elsewhere. And what can we what can we do to bring those those thoughts and ideas down here in Wales? So over to the floor. Has anybody got any questions? First of all, Brian. Um, when you're looking to go for investment, are the investors looking at a diversified social enterprise and the risks involved with that, or and, and sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm being very 
Yeah. So let's start again. Can you start hear Start again, Brian. Yeah. Start again. Uh, when, you, when, when you're looking to go for investment, are the investors or the, or the, or the loan providers looking for sustainability in an existing social enterprise or, or company? Let's call them companies. Um, or one that's looking to diverse and take a measured risk? Is, is What sort of like risk factors are you looking at in, the, in that aspect? I would answer that very simply. It depends. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's no one size fits all, and that I think is what we're trying to create. Is that we've actually got um, a situation at the moment down here where there's not too many options. Yeah. Um, there's, there's not too many, there's not too many options for startup finance for new social enterprises, new social entrepreneurs yeah. um, wanting capital to to kick their 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 idea off. Um, there's probably more finance and funding available perhaps for those that are already um, delivering and trading and producing um, uh, can, can produce a, a financial track record and I think that's part of what this debate is about. Hugh. Um, this feels like key fund territory for me. We invest a key fund in early uh, startup and early growth stage social enterprise. Um, we look at people mainly um, you know, are they faced in the right direction? Have they got a reasonably plausible idea? Um, very often, people who are good at one thing don't have the full kit. So they need, then we say to them, okay, you're great, but you need somebody to come in and do your books for you. Or you're great, but you've got no idea about marketing. You need to go and get that. I mean, those are the two key skills marketing and finance, and then the individual entrepreneur with skills. Um, uh, just pluck one out of last month's panel. Um, some black African mental health nurses in Wakefield wanting to set up a halfway house for people coming out of um, secure mental health hospitals, but before moving into the community. So if you like, solving the mental health bed blocking problem for um, uh, the NHS yeah. with a client group um, with a higher incidence of mental health problems um, but a lower take up of mental health support. So you can see that that was a good idea. We know the demands out there. If they can get the formula right, the government will pay for it through the NHS. Um, got all the nursing skills, not got the business skills. So we put 100,000 into them, but we spent 10,000 on wrapping some business skills around them. Um, it, they actually needed it to do up a premises. So um, in that sense, there was a bit of underlying security there. So it's not one size fits all at all, um, but it's looking at um, how you can structure that creatively. And the supply is out there. The shortage is people hammering on the door saying, I've got a great idea. And that is, I think, a leap of faith. It is about risk, and it, it's a risk appetite. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Can I actually use the room mic? Mike, how are you? Hello, how are you? Uh, can you hear me? Right. Um, I'm known to both of these gentlemen. Um, we have been involved in a very ambitious, uh, crazily ambitious pilot for the last six months or seven months in the valleys. I'm private sector. I know all this terminology. I've actually had my own investment fund, so I know all the stuff that's going on there. Um, and we have a team of uh, private sector partners, investors, and entrepreneurs, and executives who felt that the uh, responsibility for making a change in society should rest with them, not with the government and with respect, not with social enterprise. Inv heavily involved social enterprise to deliver the social change, but perhaps if we stepped in with our entrepreneurial skills, our particularly our innovation skills, and we partnered with the social sector, we could become that kind of, I'm gonna say it, but missing link. Um, uh, in your Venn diagram, if you imagine, uh, we'd be the bit that helped bring it together. Uh, it was very ambitious, uh, very painful, very interesting uh, process, but it's been quite fascinating. So I'm about to go back to both these gentlemen. Um, we effectively are creating uh, high growth, high profit, high margin social enterprises which are professionally managed 
and have products that will sell, we believe, in the global market on a very large scale. Tapping into the top end of the casino capitalism, which is the next hot new idea. Um, that is the dream ticket, I think, for social change, to become a player in global innovation. Um, we've got two ideas that we believe have got that global impact. We've presented them to major players in the game, some of the senior sheds and what have you, and they agree. Um, but we've also managed now to find a way to partner with the community. This is a long question, isn't it? We found, a, <laughs> we found a, a way to partner with the community. So we now have on board active participation from all the representative groups that we started the pilot with in the valleys, which includes social enterprises, SMEs, schools, colleges, uh, universities, uh, housing associations who've actually put cash in because they said, we said, hang on, we feel like we're buying all the drinks here. Uh, they actually put cash in and are putting cash in and are joining on a regular basis now to put money in because obviously their tenants need employment. Um, so suddenly this idea of a, of a couple of innovative products, which you spoke about, has, has, has grown into a situation where every single one of those representative groups is now on board. Some of them are stakeholders in these social profit companies. And this has got a little bit bigger than I anticipated. Um, we're even developing with some of the schools and colleges what we call the real life school, where they're involved in a parallel universe, if you like, in real business every single day. And as we speak right now, there are students and pupils marketing and doing market research and selling which is quite astonishing, considering the aspiration levels when we met them. Uh, there's a question coming, by the way. Um, I, had to, I had to put that because I, I think it's in context. I see people struck. I know I've been with, working with them for a couple of years now. There are a few people here who actually know me. Uh, we think this could be a catalyst for something pretty exciting, um, pretty daring, but based on all the stuff you need in a normal, high-growth, uh, reality, professional-run business. But we can't, and, we, and we're basically creating what, if I can use his words, what Liam said yesterday, we're creating what we think is one of those F-off brands um, that can make high impact globally. Um, we have 100% take up from people who want to get on board, including some very senior people, as you know, from London. Uh, who one of them phoned me up a couple of months ago and said, Mike, how's that model coming along? We've got no idea what to do about these riots. So we're in a very challenging and interesting position. We have found in the valleys speak, that there is actually an interesting amount of capital available through these Southeast Valley de development co uh, funds, probably more than we need to get these off the ground. The amount of social capital that we've, uh, we, we've found has been quite staggering. Um, we have had universities, I, I probably can't say some of this, is this going live? Yes. Um, we've had universities put pro bono in for many years. Uh, we've had Remploy, who you probably know about, uh, manufacturing the, pro the prototypes and the products. Uh, with us, at, and, is, and they're providing office facilities for the first of these to be put up in the valleys. It's a very different way of doing business. Um, and, but most importantly, if high growth innovation, the next hot new thing is, and linking that right down, so all the profits from these, these the next iP iPhone, if you like, go straight into the communities. If that is the situation, then the big problem we have is plagiarism and patent busting and copycatting. So we've had discussions with some of the majors whereby we said, look, um, you would probably bust this uh, product if you if because if it really sold and they just kind of denied that I said well but you wouldn't prob you probably would think twice if perhaps all the profits would go into your customers community and with Facebook and Twitter right now you could become famous for all the wrong reasons and they suddenly decided perhaps we'll just um, create a little special front of desk uh, you know CSR type campaign around this so we're doing all that um, we've got uh, a situation now where we're going to go forward actively trading from next week with one of the lower IP risk products um, and what the question, which I'm finally getting to, and I did that deliberately, that you can see that, that was to explain that, that we are doing something different, so if people want to come and talk to us and help us get this to work, we're very keen to do that. Uh, the question is that the risk capital you mentioned is, is, is an area. Now, uh, what we don't want to do now from this point in all this is get, get back involved with venture capitalists. I have my Dragon's Den investors who put a lot of money into these things. I've convinced them to go this way at the moment. Um, so, Risk capital in the early stage, particularly in terms of the scheme, the scheme that you're talking about, uh, is absolutely relevant. Loan. This isn't a gift. This isn't a grant. We understand exactly what you're talking about. But I I, on terms which perhaps can allow this to go forward without giving it cri crippling sort of VC type scenarios, is extremely interesting. Because uh, we don't want any charity. All of the organizations that have provided what we call deferred now payments, uh, we actually got every one of those as a stakeholder to, to get that capital back. Um, no, there's, no, there's, there's no charity involved in this whatsoever. So venture philanthropy and the kind of uh, finance you're talking about is extremely relevant to what we, we're, we're doing. So we, um, 
the question is, when can we meet? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I, Mike, I know that we did speak, and obviously we were in between funding cycles, and I know you were at that stage, you know, quite frustrated with, you know, what was happening really, and the reception that, you know, you were getting from uh, funders and, and others. Uh, so certainly, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll set something up. But, you know, from what you're suggesting, I suppose, uh, as a point of principle, it seems that you've already got a good exit strategy. And what we would be about would be certainly, uh, if you were in a position to, to repay uh, over, over a shorter period of term, we, we, we want to recycle. And we're not about uh, you know, early repayment penalties because we would see the fact that the money gets recycled and then can get shifted out again. So, yeah, but we can speak separately about that. Very quickly, Mike and I first met about four years ago when I was um, working for WCBA. And um, he outlined to me, um, I mean, this could be a major presentation on its own, so I'm not going to go into the details, Mike, so if I could cut to sort of the headline, which is effectively that Mike, Mike and, and his colleagues have created or, or developed a model which essentially involves the private sector businesses working with social enterprise, social enterprise um, to um, manufacture uh, and deliver um, products that are innovative products that are created from the private sector. So private sector investors essentially invest on the private sector side, so the money goes in. Social enterprise is then partnered up to actually deliver and, and manufacture. It, uh, uh, so that's the basic model, isn't it, Mike? In fact, now we, we license the technology into a, into a social profit company, so all the profits go to the community. Yeah, so it creates jobs within communities. Um, it creates um, uh, economic growth within communities and those profits are recycled in, but the private sector investors get their return out, so hopefully win-win situation all the way around. Um, and what I couldn't see at the time and in our discussions was how this fitted at the time with, with what we, we were delivering and how this could be sort of um, promoted um, within sort of the, the, the sector as it was at the time. So what I'd like to throw out to the floor there is, what do you think of those types of initiatives, the private sector, you know, we touched on it in, in the presentations there and setting the scene. And certainly in, in a, a, one, of the one, th one initiative that Charity Bank is involved in, the Kilk Investment Programme, um, which is um, Kilk members, third sector recycling organisations, accessing a loan program very similar to Communities Investment Fund. And one of the investments in there has been a private sector, third sector kilt joint venture, um, which is a major recycling plant um, where there are private sector investors and shareholders where the third sector through kilt has a massive involvement in the development of, of this particular recycling plant and the company. That's a very simple model, but what, is, what, are, what do you as an audience think of those types of ideas of buddying up with the, thir with the, pri with the private sector? Anybody got any thoughts or views? Brian. Yes. Sorry, Brian. Sorry. 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 Um, well, obviously, coming from the private sector myself, I think I can see the the uh, the available profits that can be made if you get a business right and you have uh, the right product. Um, the risk with that, and, and, and it's all with uh, the dragons that are providing the money up front, so to speak, is, is the diversity within the social enterprise. But that can be seen as, as, as a benefit rather than a... Because the more that you can invest on, uh, or the more products you can invest in, the more likelihood you're going to get a, a break-even, if not a good return. Uh, and obviously you're, you're achieving that now. Um, and the fact that the actual profits that are made can then be identified and moved back into the community, which is what you're saying, um, I think it's seriously the way forward. Because grants and loan providers will eventually, over the years, unless you're on this rollover, pay out, pay back in, pay out, pay back in, will eventually um, not, not disappear, will always be there, but I think there's, there's, there's a lot more that private investors could bring into. They've got a bigger pot fund than, than anything that we can probably talk about today from government and or Europe. So yes, um, I see it as a way forward. Yeah, definitely. Okay. okay. 
Anybody else? Anybody, anybody got any views on, on this particular area of the subject? Could, Hugh? Could I, could I just comment? I, I, I think the... Um, I think it's a slippery slope. Um, there's uh, a lot of discussion about social business and social enterprise. I'm particularly impatient with, oh, you've got to be in a particular legal form or not legal form. I think that we're seeing a time when um, anybody who measures simply by financial return has just completely got the wrong end of the stick. Um, the commercial market, um, the good end, if you like, of the commercial market, has been talking for years about um, what they call the ESG, environmental, social, and governance, as a filter for their investment mechanism. And they're now talking about impact investment. And there are trillions of dollars in institutional fund managers now employing that analytical methodology around investing their funds because they're saying these are the long-term protectors of value. Um, when I look at parts of Yorkshire, you know, the South Yorkshire coalfield, for instance, I think any economic activity in Thorne, in North Doncaster, is a good thing for that local community. And um, to the extent that I'm investing European and government funding, I'm constricted into some forms that say, OK, there will be some form of reinvestment. I don't want to get too dogmatic about that. And certainly I know big society capital is using a very fuzzy version of social business in terms of what it will be prepared to invest in. Um, I'm much more interested in anti-poverty stuff, in disadvantage, um, and genuinely doing some impactful investment than I am particularly about um, the legal shape or form. What I think is important, though, is the values. And if you are aligning yourself with people who are in it because they want to extract a pot of gold from it, um, then I think that that value misalliance probably means a vulnerable business model. Um, and clearly, um, we need to be careful of, I don't know, we've been looking at asset transfer, you know, transferring assets out of the public sector into vehicles um, that then allow people to extract a pot of gold out of it. I believe that there's ways of structuring that um, so that you, you can prevent against that as far as possible. But I do think the misalliance of values is, is a serious concern, if it exists. And there are lots of people, it seems to me, who are capitalists, so-called, or private sector, so-called, actually, who are passionate about um, the impact that their work's having, particularly local people, particularly family firms. I think there's a huge market around social enterprise buying out family firms buying out existing successful business models. Why are we always starting from the ground floor up? Why don't we go in and buy stuff that's working and say we're just going to make it better in the social enterprise vehicle? Can I ask? Can I ask? Just the gentleman behind the mic, he's been holding on to it for ages. <laughs> okay. Thank you. My name's Julian. Um, this, a lot of this is very new to me, so uh, bear with me. But I hope my question will kind of tie in, <coughs> excuse me, with the first question, which I found very interesting. Um, on the last question, um, my business idea, which I hope one day will be a social enterprise, could very easily be a private business that would be just for profit to benefit me and my family. Um, a long time ago, I did try self-employment, um, and I think my focus probably at the time was for myself and my family. Having gone through a number of different situations and life crises, I realized life is more important than that. Um, the idea of running an enterprise for the benefit of the wider community and to put something back in, be it in terms of uh, financial gain or um, life skills, um, motivation, etc., is something that appeals to me more now than ever. And um, I'd like to push an idea forward, and I'm, I'm very privileged to have been asked to present something later on in one of the UPOD sessions. So whilst I'm nervous, I'm, 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 I like the idea of, of being able to do that. Um, but from somebody like myself who has got very little um, personal investment um, 
but yet would want to push something forward. As investors, be it grants or loans, what do you think I should be uh, asking for in terms of grant assistance? Uh, what risks should I be prepared to put forward myself? And what should I be looking for in terms of, of loans as a mix? Is there a, a rough formula uh, for what I should be going for? Or is it like what you've said, um, you would look at an individual case, judge the person, say, is this person a risk? Because um, I'm, I'm at the very sort of uh, initial point of, of hopefully trying to access some funding. Thank you. Okay, we've gone from, um, from one extreme to another, but it's a great question. Jeff? Yeah, I, th I think uh, really it would be, I'd, I'd need to understand the business model of what you're looking to do before we could really give a definitive answer to that. Uh, because obviously some business models almost, you know, are going to go straight forward towards trading, towards income diversification from, from a start off really. Uh, uh, so therefore, what some people who are, you know, uh, indicated as being social entrepreneurs often they, they want to move they, they're not interested in going down the, the grant route because the one thing about that is that you know, they, they feel that it's t time consuming and also that you know that they're then quite restricted in, in what they can do and what they can deliver so that they're, they're look they're looking to have that flexibility um, but obviously in terms of what we funded as I, as I said really often it is a sometimes people come to us and they initially have this, uh, oh, is, is it gra grants or loans? And that somehow we're going to say, oh, you, you, no, no, it has to be all loans. But from a, from a, a risk perspective, it often is good for, for a number of reasons. Obviously, it reduces our risk. It shows that organizations have, have gone in and looked at what you're trying to do and, and are behind you. So they've done an element of due diligence. So, you know, that can give us some comfort there, really. Um, it also means that you're going to have some sort of support mechanisms, you know, so it, for example, if you've, I don't know who you've been in contact with, but if you go through, uh, whether it's the Wales Co-op Centre or, or the CVCs, you know, they're hopefully going to identify and help you either with your business planning or with, with routes that you can go towards accessing grants, really. Um, so I think it's not necessarily either or, it's, it's, it's what you're looking to do, so the business model's key. Um, but yeah, we, as I say, we would work with, with, with you on that basis, really. We would look at the social return, community benefit, but also you know, wh whether it indicated that there was an ability to repay and whether it, w it was right to do that. Because the one thing we're not about is, you know, it's, it's not going to work because you're probably not going to be in a position to repay us if it's clear that you're not in the position to generate income at this stage in your development. So then we may say you need to look at another route and then maybe come back to us you know, in terms of your growth as an organization. Investors understand that it takes time to make, oh. <laughs> Investors understand that it takes time to make money. Um, if you're in this first bit where you're underwater and you need some funding for a year or two years, before you can start to repay, doesn't mean that you can't use debt finance, yeah, or quasi-equity finance. Your own investment is your sweat equity. It is your preparedness to work for six months, a year, to develop an idea and not get paid for it, or not get paid very much for it. Um, that is your contribution, it seems to me. And I don't think you should be frightened just because, you know, there's a while before your idea will get break even doesn't mean that it's not an investable idea. Um, if you look at, particularly in, in, in you know, the high tech market, um, uh, you know, there was the huge bubble, but people were investing masses and masses amount of money in things that didn't make money at all. They just gobbled money for years and years and years. But then the market leaders emerged and made Masses and masses of money, all night. Um, we're, we're looking at things like um, uh, LinkedIn just raised a, a whole load of capital, the, the, the business network, after many years of development. Um, so don't be frightened, just be real about what stage you're at in your business idea and get the appropriate amount of money. Uh, Keyfund does year long capital repay, repayment holidays. Um, 
we like to see interest. We like to see a little bit of money because it's an easy way of telling people that, you know, that they're still alive. If the direct debit doesn't come in every month, then it rings an alarm with us and we get on the phone and you say, are you still, are you still doing the business? Um, but also sometimes we give interest, uh, interest holidays as well. So um, there is investment finance out there for a good idea. What I'd say is, though, in order for a business to have social impact, it's got to work. <laughs> so it has to be a good business idea in the first place. Um, a business idea that doesn't work doesn't create any impact, it just creates grief. So um, the focus is on a good business idea first, and then about how you might distribute the, the, the benefit or impact. I'd echo Hugh's last comment there that it has to be a business idea that works. Um, yeah. Do you have a in Gymraeg? So, we'll see if I can see then that part. Well, we mean in Greece, you're a friend's bedtime. I'm coming at that loud. The Lini Vod Norn, but the Kum Fon, Kun Fon, and a squid key are a bit. Can you can you expand on that? Yeah. Um, which tail, which dog? Clema Muya and an incriminate that near a bridge at the at the light cloud. I see Kivin Toshol ever. Come I say, woman cook. Um, there, the Nasema come Muya and I'm done eating in the event. Clema come from several bankia, Kavala, the Tehra, we all your cocks. I'm in a very young me. to a, a, a greater or lesser extent. And I think that's why we're here today, quite frankly, and I think that's what this workshop is about. Um, one of the most empowered, we, we haven't really talked about it at all. Um, Hugh touched on it. I, I, mine was a bullet point in my presentation. Hugh touched on it very, very briefly in his. Um, but I think one of the most powerful funding mechanisms for poor communities um, is community share issues. Now, I know that the argument will come back, well, people don't have any money in poor communities. Uh, I think they're, they're the, 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 um, uh, I've worked on a community's first project um, myself, um, and I know that community's first areas are very often not quite that simple in terms of, of social deprivation and, and poverty, that actually they're, they're quite mixed economies, and you can have real highs and lows of um, the poorest in that community are just not engaging with the with the, the wealthiest in that community, but they're all sitting side by side. Classic example is Butte Town down here in Cardiff. Masses amounts of wealth, and then round the corner is is a community's first area and huge deprivation. So, sorry, my point is, and it is only because we're we're running out of time, is that community share issues are a brilliant example of how you could. Um, you, you can take a particular project, be it uh, you know, something addressing community deprivation that has an economic viability to it as long as it engages all of that community but where you can get those communities coming together um, and where finance can be leveraged in to, you know, to address um, social deprivation. It's a really, really simple and one, only one answer to what is a massive question. We could run a whole workshop on it. To answer your, your initial question, yes, I think the tail is wagging the dog, and I think that's why we're here today. Thank you. Preventative enterprise, I think. Analyze in a poor community what the cost of the state of pe keeping people in poverty. You know, we know it costs more to lock a young man up than to send them to Eton. So it's that analysis um, that, uh, and then and then a million other things in terms of getting the political support right, getting the competition out of the way, dealing with all the bureaucracy and structure and that kind of thing. But that's the real key. And I think local people within communities 
learning to do stuff for themselves. And you don't need to have very many successes to start racking up real big social impact. Um, understanding that, proving it, pitching it with confidence to intelligent procurers if you can find them, um, and if not, using a political route, I think is really important. Little bits of money raised in poor communities, um, the widow's might, if you like. The Rochdale pioneers, the first community shareholders, did a penny a week for two and a half years, because it was in the old days when there were however many there were, 244 pennies in a pound, were there? <laughs> Something like that, 240. So you had to save for 240 weeks before you could buy your one pound share. But they did that, and that was the origin of the co-op movement. Why wouldn't you do that? Why would you go into the dysfunctional casino of the financial market? Um, the other thing is, we know nobody's going to help poor communities. We, we know if you go to government with your hand out, they're always going to keep you short of money. So it has to be around local initiative and local enterprise. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We've come to the end of the workshop. Thank you very much.